Leia here from LeiaPersai.com slash MCAT, and in this video we're going to look at zwitter ions and finding the charge of an amino acid. Amino acids are often drawn in the neutral form, such as glycine represented here. We have the alpha carbon with the hydrogen and side chain, the alpha carboxy group, and the alpha amine. That's how we get amino acid, an amine and an acid. But the problem is that with the amine being basic and the carboxylic acid being acidic, this is not the correct form for drawing an amino acid since acids and bases will react with each other. If I put these two molecules together, nitrogen would use its lone pair of basic electrons to grab the acidic hydrogen from the carboxy group, giving it back the electrons. And when enough amino acids react with each other, we would get something that looks like this. The carboxy group is now deprotonated to give us a negative carboxylate. The amine group now has three hydrogens because it's protonated, no longer has a lone pair, but gets a positive charge. Which is the correct form in nature? Depending on the pH, you're more likely to see this form in nature. The neutral form cannot exist because of the acid-base interactions. In nature, they're not going to react with each other. They're going to react with a solution, but the idea is the same. We're going to get a zwitter ion or dipolar ion. Zwitter ion comes from the German word zwitter, which means double and ion charged. The zwitter ion has at least two charged groups on the molecule. Acidic and basic side chains can have a third charge in their variable group. Let's break this down and see how you find the charge of an amino acid at any given pH. The key here is to recognize that acids will donate a proton and bases will accept or attack a proton. If you're not solid with this concept, make sure you review the acid-base tutorial linked below. Once again, we have the neutral form of glycine. In order to figure out the charge, you want to start with a neutral form and then look for the pKa values. The pKa values, one for each acid or base, is going to tell you at which pH it's going to gain or lose a proton. To find the charge, ask yourself, what is the pH of any ionizable group, and will that group be protonated or deprotonated based on the pKa? Before we look at finding amino acid charge at a specific pH, we have to understand the relationship of pH and pKa. The acid-base tutorial series linked below explains the relationship of Ka to acid concentration. Ka is equal to H plus times A minus over HA, and that tells us that Ka is proportional to the H plus concentration, where H plus concentration tells us the pH. From Ka, we can find the pKa, given that pKa is equal to negative log of the Ka, and finally, the relationship of pH and pKa can be found with the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, where pH is equal to pKa plus the log of conjugate base over acid. If you're not comfortable with this, see the tutorial link below. So what do we make of this expression? pKa tells us how likely the molecule is to take a proton from solution or donate a proton to the solution. And what does the pH tell us? Well, if we have a low pH, that means we have an acidic solution. An acidic solution means that we have lots of H plus floating around, so many H pluses that we just start pumping them onto the molecules dissolved in solution. A high pH tells us that we have a basic solution. Basic solutions have lots of OH minus. And OH minus as a negative ion is looking to take protons away from our molecule dissolved in solution. Now you have to compare the two. How does the acidity or basicity of the solution compare to the molecule's desire to hold on to that H plus? When you're comparing the pH and the pKa, just think of it as a battle for the proton. The higher value has a stronger desire for the proton and takes it away from the other. If the pH is higher, the solution wins, and if the pKa is higher, the molecule wins. When the pH is less than the pKa, we're looking at a low pH and therefore an acidic solution. Which one wins? If the pKa is higher, the molecule is stronger and the molecule takes the proton away from solution. You can also think of it as a low pH has a lot of protons and therefore some of it gets donated to the molecule. 
Therefore, if the pH is less than the pKa, the molecule will be protonated. If the pH is greater than the pKa, we're looking at a higher pH or basic solution. The pH means that the solution wins and takes the proton away from the molecule. That means the molecule is going to be deprotonated. And finally, when the pH is near the pKa, we have a stalemate. The pH representing the solution wants the proton just as strongly as the pKa, which represents the molecule, and this puts us into the buffer zone. If the pH is equal to the pKa, then we have a 50-50, meaning half the molecules are protonated and half are deprotonated. But if the pH is within one unit of the pKa, you're still going to see the buffer zone, but you'll have more protonated or more deprotonated depending on the direction. When the pH is within one unit of the pKa, but the pH is lower, you're going to have more protonated than deprotonated. If it's higher, you'll have more deprotonated than protonated, but still within that partially charged region. Amino acids have a carboxylic acid in their backbone. So let's look at acetic acid, a very simple carboxylic acid with a pKa of approximately 4.8. What does this tell us about the molecule? Acetic acid is happy to donate its proton depending on the solution. If acetic acid is dissolved in an acidic solution, we have too many protons, and that means the Le Chatelier's principle says we push the reaction towards the reactants to the left, and we protonate acetic acid. If acetic acid is dissolved in a basic solution, the base, the OH- minus, is pulling the protons out of equilibrium, and that means the Le Chatelier's principle pushes the reaction to the right, favoring products, and we deprotonate the acid. Let's look at different pH ranges. We'll start with a pH that is less than the pKa, for example, if pH is equal to 2. A pH of 2 is significantly lower than 4.8, and that means we have so many protons in solution that we're going to protate every available acetate and get acetic acid. The charge is equal to 0. We have a neutral molecule. If the pH is equal to 4.8, pH is equal to the pKa, we're going to get 50% protonated and 50% deprotonated. Half the molecules grab a proton, but the solution takes the proton away from the other half of the molecules. The charge in this case, the average charge of all the molecules in solution, will be equal to minus one half. Why negative a half? We have a charge of zero for the protonated form, a charge of negative 1 for the deprotonated form, and the average between 0 and negative 1 is negative a half. This is an estimate. At pH is equal to 4.8, it's negative a half. As the pH goes up, the charge becomes more negative. As the pH goes down, the charge becomes less negative, with the ideal buffer range within a pH unit above or below the pKa value. If the pH is equal to 3.8, we have a 10 to 1 ratio of protonated to deprotonated following the henderson hasselbach calculation. If we raise the pH all the way to 8, it's a very basic solution. We have an overwhelming amount of OH-, and the OH- is much more desperate for the proton than the acetic acid. That means OH- will take away all the protons, and we have acetate in solution for a charge of negative 1. The numbers will change slightly on an amino acid because the pKa of the carboxy side chain will vary depending on what else we have nearby, but we're going to use the same principle with a specific pKa value. Amino acids have amines on their backbone, so let's look at an alkylamine, in this case methylamine. But since we're looking at a pKa and methylamine is a base, we have to look at the conjugate acid protonated form methyl ammonium. Methyl ammonium will be in equilibrium with its conjugate base methylamine, giving off a proton in solution. Methyl ammonium has a pKa of 10.6, which tells us a pH of 10.6 will give me a buffer between methylamine and methyl ammonium. If instead we try to apply a pKa value to a base, we're calling this base an acid, and methylamine can actually act as an acid or a base. Well, the acidic form of this molecule is going to give us CH3NH with two lone pairs and a negative charge on nitrogen. 
This is a very, very, very strong conjugate base, and you're not going to see this in the side chain of amino acids. Amino acid nitrogens will accept a proton to get a positive charge or donate a proton to become neutral, but the neutral amine will never donate a proton to become negative in physiological conditions. Let's see what happens at different pH values. If we start with a pH significantly lower than the pKa, let's put the pH equal to 7. This means, compared to the methyl ammonium's desire to hold on to that proton, the pH is much, much, much more acidic. That means the pH has so many protons, it doesn't want the proton for methyl ammonium. The pH is lower than the pKa, and so the molecule wins. The form is going to be methyl ammonium, CH3, NH3+, and the charge is equal to plus 1. If we raise the pH well past the pKa to a value of 13, the pH is higher than the pKa. That means the pH, the solution, has a stronger desire for that proton. Methyl ammonium will give up its proton to give me the form CH3NH2, because we took away the third hydrogen, and the charge in this case is neutral. It's not negative because we started positive, so we dropped down to neutral. Acetic acid started neutral, so we drop down to negative. And finally, if we take a pH that is approximately the pKa value, for example, a pH of 10, it's slightly less than the pKa, that means it's slightly more acidic than the pKa, but we're still in the buffer zone. Because the pH is within one pH unit of the pKa, but it's towards the acidic side, we're going to get the acidic CH3 and H3 plus in a higher concentration than the CH3 and H2. And that means the charge will be somewhere between 0 and positive 1. And so we can say that 0 is less than the charge, which is less than positive 1. The exact number can be calculated using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. But in the MCAT, you don't have a calculator, so you're not expected to know the specifics. Instead, you have to be able to pinpoint the range. If the 50-50 range will be positive 1 half, and it's more acidic, that means we're closer to the plus 1, it'll actually be somewhere between positive 1 half and positive 1. Let's apply this to the amino acid glycine. The pKa for the carboxy group is 2.3 and the pKa for the amine is 9.6. Let's see what happens when we have the pH less than, greater than, and equal to every pKa value. Let's start at a pH is equal to 1. pH 1 is less than both pKa values. That means the solution has more protons, and the solution will give protons to the molecule. Or think of it, as the pKa is higher than the pH, and so the pKa's desire for the protons win. The amine group is protonated to NH3+, the carboxy group is protonated to OH, and if we add up both charges, we get positive 1 for the amine, 0 for the carboxy, for a net Q of positive 1, where Q is the charge. If we raise the pH to the first pKa value, we're going to get a buffer at the first pKa. The carboxy group will be partially protonated and partially deprotonated, which means half of the molecules will have a negative one charge, half of the molecules will be neutral, so we'll say that the charge is equal to negative a half. The amine has a pKa greater than the pH and will be protonated for a charge of plus one. The net charge of plus one minus a half is equal to positive one half. If we raise the pH somewhere between the two pKa values, for example, pH is equal to seven, that's very near physiological pH, that's where we expect to see the Zwitter ion, but let's prove it. The amine pKa is higher than the pH, and so it'll be protonated, gives me a charge of plus one. The carboxy pKa is lower than the pH, so it'll be deprotonated for a charge of negative one, if we add up plus 1 minus 1, charge is equal to 0. This is our Zwitter ion. I want you to pay attention to a trend that's happening here. As we raise the pH, we went from plus 1, and we're dropping to plus a half, plus 0, so we kept dropping half. I want you to realize with me 
that if we raise the pH to the next pKa value, for this amino acid, it should be negative a half. And if we raise it above the pKa value, it should be negative one. Let's prove it. We'll bring the pH to 9.6, which is the pKa of the amine. That means half the amines will be protonated, half will be deprotonated. Protonated amines have a charge of plus one. Deprotonated amines are neutral, giving me a charge of plus one half. The pH is much greater than the pKa, and so the carboxy group is deprotonated for a charge of negative one. Plus one half minus one is equal to negative one half as we predicted. And finally, when we bring the pH well above both pKa values, we expect the pH to win and steal all possible protons. The amine group will be protonated to a neutral NH2. The carboxy group will be deprotonated to a charge of negative 1. And when we add them up, 0 minus 1 is equal to negative 1, once again, as predicted. Another trend to keep in mind here, when the pH is at a pKa, your net charge is going to be somewhere near a half. When the pH is well above or well below the pKa values, you're going to get a whole number. What whole number? This depends on the specific pH and any groups on the molecule, including side chain and backbone. For even more practice on finding amino acid and peptide charge, be sure to try the quiz along with my tutorial series and amino acid cheat sheet by visiting my website, layerforsci.com slash amino acids.